Here we go. I can see everything from here. Especially the glaciation of the sloping strata. It's breathtaking. Here, I have to ask, what did Maud Pie say? Well, she's making a comment on the local rocks in the area, presumably from the high vantage point of the Pony Statue of Liberty. She can see some sort of cliff face or something that slopes. Now, sloping strata means that the slope of the overlying land follows the slope of the strata, that is, layers of different types of rocks below that. So ordinarily, you might have a slope here, and then on top of it, but on top of it, it would be a hill or something. With sloping strata, the hill is the same slope as the strata. One of the ways this can happen is through glaciation, which is a glacier rolls over the land. Now the glacier creates friction, and it'll wear down any weaker rock or dirt or whatever on top of the slope. But if there's a hard rock underneath it, hard rock, then the uh, glacier will wear down to just that layer, hard rock cafe. Uh, anyway, therefore, you'll wind up with a hill that follows the, the slope of that. The glacier on top will keep any new debris or such from depositing on the layer. Glacier goes away. It takes hundreds of thousands of years for a new hill or different shape to build up so you get sloping strata. Therefore, Maud is looking at such a formation somewhere near the island of Manhattan, possibly some sort of cliff on the mainland. Up next. Oh, a pony could get used to eating at places like this. I know. It's the only restaurant in the city with Nephilim cyanite in their bathroom tiles. Now what did Maud say? This one is interesting. She talks about Nephilim cyanite and mentions that the fact that that is in the bathroom tiles is why she likes that restaurant the best. Now, of course, it plays into her particular strengths. I'd like to point out that this is a very weird spelling. It's spelled N-E-P-H-E-L-I-N-E-S-Y-E-N-I-T-E. Took me a while to find this one because I kept spelling it wrong. Uh, it's a mix of nepheline and feldspar. It's a sort of intrusive igneous rock. We mentioned feldspar earlier. It is rich in alkalis and rare earth metals. So it tends not to merge quite smoothly. It's undersaturated in silica, so it has less silicon than other sorts of minerals and cannot coexist in quartz, because quartz is mostly silicon, and the stuff in nepheline cyanide will actually react with quartz over time, forming some sort of uh, metamorphic rock. It produces an alkali feldspar. Now, nepheline cyanide is often used in ceramics, such as making ceramic bathroom tiles. But nepheline cyanide is semi-rare. It's found in a couple places around the world. There's deposits in Texas. Uh, there's some big ones in northern Russia. But there's only one deposit in Great Britain and only one deposit in France, for instance. So it tends to be more expensive than other components you can use with clay to make ceramics. But its advantage is when you use it as what's called a flux, something you add into clay and other materials when you're making ceramics, it creates a lower melting temperature than, almost, than most other mixtures. This means that you can melt and shape your ceramic uh, without as, using as much energy because you don't need to be as hot. Your furnace doesn't need to be as hot. Um, 
The other good thing about it is it creates a brilliant white tile, much the color of my lab coat here. And this uh, tile also has a more even uh, heating curve, which means that it uh, will retain its shape through temperature changes better. You only need to be less, you don't have to be quite as careful about what kind of gaps you leave, and you don't have to be quite as careful when you're shaping it and it's cooling. This means it's a superior material if you ever want white tile. Again, white, this color. But it is more expensive. Thus, the fact that the restaurant has nepheline cyanide in their bathroom tiles means that they are a more upscale restaurant. Hence, Maude is complimenting them on the fact that they didn't skimp on the bathroom tiles. There is a um, disadvantage to using nepheline cyanide in that it is somewhat soluble in water. So the tiles will have a tendency to warp over time. It can also be used to make a glaze that goes on top of ceramic tiles. But because of uh, that solubility, the glaze will tend to crack. It's called crazing for some reason. But uh, glaze cracking, I guess, it gets portmanteau. Anyway, uh, glaze made with nepheline cyanide will crack. So there are disadvantages. Uh, so there are disadvantages, but it is generally considered a superior tile material if you want white tile, but it is a bit more expensive. So Maud's statement here actually makes a great deal of sense. The upscale restaurant spent more to make good bathroom tiles. All right, next up. I like that fissure in the sidewalk. It's an elegant example of thermal expansion and soil settlement. So, examining a crack on the sidewalk, what did she say? Well, in this case, she is noting both uh, soil settlement and thermal expansion. Now, the thermal expansion has two parts, so I'll mention the soil settlement first. If you've ever looked into architecture or you've owned a house, you may know about soil settlement. If you put soil under pressure, it will compact. Uh, this can be from a building on top of it, but can also be from, say, students cutting a corner and walking across the same patch of soil day after day for years. This causes the soil to sink down because it's now more compact. And if you have a house on top, often one side will sink down more than the other. So now your house is on an incline. When it wasn't before, this can stress the foundation and make it crack. So you have to watch this with houses particularly older ones or areas where there's a lot of rain because that can desettle some of the soil. Anyway, it's a whole thing. Now, if you have a sidewalk on top of it, you can get the same thing. The soil settles on e easily beneath one sidewalk slab, and the sidewalk cracks. This creates the initial crack or fissure in the sidewalk. Uh, other things that can create a crack in the sidewalk, two different sidewalk segments pushed together, and when it heats up, they expand, and they push against each other harder. I guess you can't really tell, but that is what I was doing. This means that they are, again, under stress and will often crack. Uh, this is why there are often expansion zones in roadways and areas where there's high tef temperature differentials. You see these little, like, metal strips. Basically, that's for the asphalt to expand into during the summer. And then the metal strip has a little give in it somehow. So then it'll, you know, compress or expand as the weather gets colder or hotter, uh, meaning your odds of your road cracking are lower. The other sort of thermal expansion is a bit of a weird example, but the way cracks in rocks and sidewalks generally widen is water pools in them and freezes. And as you may know, while most things contract when they get cold, water actually expands when it freezes. It contracts when it gets cold down to a point, but then it starts expanding. This causes cracks to widen as water freezes, melts, freezes, melts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Maud is making a note that a sidewalk crack is, in fact, a good example of thermal expansion and soil settlement. Not that it's all that interesting, in my opinion, although the fact that there was a tuft of grass I thought was rather interesting. Uh, there's poetry about things growing in sidewalk cracks where you don't expect any living thing to grow.
Now after the break, we see a bit more on the sidewalk crack. Do you see the exposed chalcedony in the fissure? Probably. Maud talks about exposed chalcedony in the, fi in the fissure. Now that turns out to be spelled C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N-Y. Another one I kept misspelling. It is yet another form of silica. It is composed of a fine intergrowth of It's a fine intergrowth of two different types of rock, one being quartz, the other being mogant. I can't pronounce it right. Now Mogant has a hexagonal-ish crystal structure, or quartz has a hexagonal-ish crystal structure, but Moganite, there we go, is uh, does not. It has a crystal lattice formed from rectangular prisms with parallel bases. This means that they don't naturally tile up. You have to force them together with heat and pressure. This creates a chalcedony. It has a waxy luster and comes in a wide range of colors. It is often used for semi-precious gemstones. Um, these are sold for commercial use. Now, there's a word in the biblical book of Revelations which is translated chalcedony, but the word in Greek appears nowhere else. It's basically a loan word from Latin. Um, Thus, we're not entirely certain what gemstone is referred to in that case. I didn't actually want to get into that, but if you're curious, you can look that up. If you're curious, you can look that up. It's probably from the name of the town Chalcedon or Chalcedon in Asia Minor. Um, now, Chalcedon nodules or little bubbles, basically, often form in the middle of limestone result of various impurities. And lime, which is derived from limestone, is used to make sidewalks. So particularly if you're making you know, a cheap sidewalk or something, it's not unthinkable that you would see chalc uh, chalcedony nodules, little bubbles, bits, embedded in the sidewalk. Now the top is often smoothed and the chalcedony might settle out of the top. So you might not see it out on the top of the sidewalk, but if the sidewalk were cracked, you could conceivably see it down inside. Now, a sidewalk made more recently is unlikely to have these. There's you know, more mechanical processes that separate and settle all these different irregularities, so they're not in there. But older sidewalks, you might see this. I've seen some sidewalks with little bits stuck in there. Some of those are probably chalcedony or chalcedony, assuming Maud's pronouncing it correctly. I'm not sure if I am. That is it for this edition of What Did Maud Pie Say? I'm sure if she shows up again, I'll be able to have a little update or two. Uh, but for the time being, I hope this has given you insight into what she is saying. It is uh, determinable from this, or at least a reasonable guess, that Maud is, in her own way, attempting to ex make things understandable for people and explain why she finds things interesting. She's just really bad at this. Her soothing monotone doesn't help. Um, I also noticed re-watching these episodes that even in the very first episode, which made a big point of her monotone, she actually shows a lot of inflection, such as when she's scolding Pinkie Pie or even when she's just talking to the other people. And we also see that she makes what might be jokes, uh, like... It doesn't say anything. It's a dress. I mean, she has to have some knowledge of metaphor. It's possible she doesn't, but it's also possible that she's attempting humor there. Uh, so that ends my explanations of what Maud is saying and brief analysis of what that says about her. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to comment. If you did not, well, then uh, I personally feel like I could do a lot better on these myself, maybe make some constructive criticism, but don't just say random stuff because if you're just telling me how bad I am, there's a decent chance I agree. That's it for this time. Tune in next time and drive safely. 
My little pony, my little pony, what will today's adventure be? My little pony, my little pony, plus something, yeah. Don't know what they're saying here. My little pony, my little pony, I'll be there right by your side. I'll be there, right by your side.